So I'm preparing for my first TED talk, but it occurred to me that many people have issues with public speaking. And so I've gone through the book TED Talks and I'm going to take you through what I've learned so you don't have to spend as much time preparing for your talk. This is a one page summary. I love short form. It's an app, which this is not sponsored by the way, which allows me to get through a lot of books, whether through audio or summary. So I really want to share this with you for that reason as a public speaker for the last, I don't know, 30 odd years and I get asked to do a lot of it. I think if we can improve public speaking generally, well, we in the audience will also be a lot happier. So this was written in 2016. TED Talks is actually from the head of TED. Uh, so it's somebody uh, worth uh, really listening to. Why is public speaking so scary? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Well, Anderson says the fear of public speaking is twofold. There's this in-the-moment fear of temporary humiliation, stumbling over words, forgetting what to say, and so on. I don't personally tend to have that. I don't know why. Maybe I need to see a psychiatrist why I don't have that fear. Uh, but I do sometimes have the heart-pounding uh, palpitations that come with looking at who's in the audience and thinking, well, wow, I really don't want to mess up in front of them. Most people care deeply, of course, about what others think, and that impacts somebody experienced like me, as well as somebody who's a novice. And they worry what a public flop will change the way they're viewed, okay? Because you're likely to have to speak publicly at some point, whether you fear it or not, you better get used to it. And if there was a secret source to getting ahead in your career, I think public speaking is it, because it elevates you onto a stand, it helps you network a lot easier, uh, and it just gets you noticed and picked to do more things, because there isn't much competition up there on stage. Anderson says the first step is to face your fear by debunking common misconceptions. One misconception is you need to have a stage and an audience to be a public speaker. Not so. I'm public speaking right now, if you think about it. As Anderson says, that isn't to say the I that the idea needs to be new to the world. It need only be new to your audience. And presumably, public speaking, whilst it's not new, the things that I'm going to share with you in this presentation will be hopefully new to you. Your idea is the topic you want to discuss. Okay, we've got to get that nub of an idea first. Some ideas are big, like an invention that'll save lives, making the world a better place. Others are just an observation about human nature. And from that, you can start your talk. To avoid it being rambling, work out what the idea is first that you want to get across and don't make it too big and rambly. After coming up with that idea, Anderson says the next step is to determine your through line, the lesson you want your audience to take away. Because you want them to have something left in their mind. They can say, right, this was about improving my public speaking, and these are the th ways in which to do it, and that's a problem which is worth tackling and overcoming. Engage your audience. Developing a solid idea and strong through line are the first steps to a successful speech, but they don't guarantee you'll make an impact. Anderson explains that you must connect with your audience in order to be effective and memorable. For me, it's all an act. When I'm on stage, I'm on stage as an actor, okay? I don't obviously go around in conversations with friends, waving my arms around and being so animated. Otherwise, they just think I need to sit in a dark space. It provides strategies for engaging your audience based on the type of speech you're giving. So what are some of these strategies? Well, meet them where they are. Spark the audience's curiosity, for example, by posing a question without an obvious answer or showing a striking image. Introduce terminology and concepts one by one using familiar metaphors, clear examples, and stories. Do a jargon check, remove the jargon. So when you're preparing that speech, you've got your idea, then break it down. What, what's the opener? Don't just rush into it. Take time to think these things through. What could be a good hook? We all watch TV where we see the first opening scene of a series. They're trying to grab our attention. They, they, or a good article you might have read and you see in the first paragraph, oh, they've twisted it. I wasn't expecting that. Those are hooks. You can use that in your own public speaking. Okay, always stay on topic. Unless you're an amazing speaker, in which case ramble on. But for most people, they should really stay on topic. Clarity over accuracy. Now, <laughs> that's a difficult one. Uh, but what I think he's talking about there is it's better to make a clear point than 
have 500 footnotes that you're reading out and saying, um, uh, let me modify that. Well, sometimes this and being rather weak, it's better to have clear data points. And then you can always offline talk about the nuances, but make that high impact key issues first. And obviously always be truthful. Tell them why this matters to you and why it matters to them. Strategies for persuasive speeches. Now, most of the speeches I give fall into this category. To change someone's opinion, Anderson says, you must nudge them in your direction one small step at a time. One small step at a time. Grab a piece of paper, work out the end goal you want and the starting points and how those bits are going to connect up. Okay? Appeal to logic. That's one key way, obviously, of persuasion. The Greeks came up with this. Anderson says the appeals to logic are the most commonly used technique in persuasive speaking, and they include citing evidence, expert opinions, using if this, then this statements to show cause and effect, displaying statistics, and using anecdotes as well. Discredit the opposite stance. That's another way of doing it. Humor can sometimes work. Anderson says an effective persuasive technique is to display the opposite viewpoint and show your audience why it won't work why it's an inferior choice, or why it's dangerous or immoral. Okay, And you've got to handle the other side. Remember at university when we were taught, we're writing essays, and we're trying to make an argument, we've got to tackle what the other side is saying and then why they're wrong. But don't create straw men, don't create false arguments of what the other side's saying, just so it's easier to blow over. People aren't stupid, they can see through that. Okay, <clears throat> Anderson provides five strategies to connect with your audience. Meet their eyes, I know that can be difficult, and a bit intimidating, drop your ego. Look, if you get something wrong, you know, I've dropped papers and all sorts and I've laughed it off. They want to help you. They want to be on your side. And it's okay to be vulnerable and saying, you know what, I'm a bit nervous. First time I'm doing one of these or whatever else it might be. Use humor if you can, if you're natural at it, I am. If not, tell them a story. You know, stories are really powerful. Make it short, pithy, uh, practice it on someone and you know, generally practicing storytelling is really good. You know who I practice my storytelling on? My son, who's four years old. If I can keep the attention of a four-year-old, you're laughing. You can use any or all of these strategies in your speech. Okay, writing and rehearsing your speech. All speeches fall into one of four ca ca categories. Scripted and memorized. Wow. Scripted and read. Ooh, don't like those. Unscripted but planned out. That's usually me. Unscripted and given off the cuff. Sometimes I've had to do this. Anderson strongly discourages winging speeches as he considers them disrespectful to the audience and their time. And that's, I'd agree with that. He explores the benefits, risk and rehearsal strategies for the other three. Scripting and memorizing is the favorite option because it gives a feeling of control and preparation. Now, my TED Talk will be scripted, but I'm not going to read off a script. I'm going to try and memorize it. Uh, and that's going to be difficult because it's 15 minutes to do it. Anderson says it's key to push past this stage and continue to practice. You'll eventually know the speech so well that you're no longer concentrating on the words and the passion will return to your voice. And that's got to be key. You know, sometimes at the top of my speeches, before I even go on, and, and if it's just an outline or just a, a comfort blanket, even though I'm not going to be reading off it, I'll write passion okay at the top to remind myself because we forget how much this stuff means to us when we're in the heat of the moment writing and rehearsing your speech benefits to this anderson says there are two occasions when reading your speech works well and i try and avoid it firstly if the speech is paired with gorgeous imagery and your audience's eyes are on your images instead of you okay that makes sense uh um category three we're going through jumping around the categories here uh unscripted say something dramatic within the first minute. And I usually have written out or memorized in my head how I'm going to do my opening. And that really calms me down and calms down uh, how I'm going to go through this. Show a fascinating image. That's always, it's a bit of a ploy, but you know it works. Pete their curiosity with a question or counterintuitive statement. For instance, my talk is, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? I think it's a question worth investigating. I look at the research and the connections between wealth, happiness, and the causes of wealth and happiness. And IQ is only one of them. And then I look at what, what the research shows uh, might actually help. Closing, apply what you've discussed to a broader situation. So for instance, in my case, it's not just about money. It's about happiness more broadly. Declare a personal mission. I have a mission to teach more people about wealth creation. 
And I think that's important because it's important for their mental health, it's important for their productivity, and it's important for their later life and retirement. You see, the bigger thing, leave them with a dream. Call them to action and with beautiful language. So there you have it. The closing could be the Julius Caesar type, Veni, Vidi, Vici. <laughs> you have to be Julius Caesar to pull that one off. I do like General Patton, but I hate reading. You can't read a great quote with the passion Patton delivered it by reading it off a script. It doesn't work. It's a cheat. It's a cop-out. I've seen speakers do it. But unless you've got the same passion and you've held it all the way through the speech, then it ain't going to work. If it just suddenly pops up because you think, oh, I'll leave them with this and I'll just, you know, they'll give me the same cheer the soldiers would have given Patton, it won't work. Thomas Jefferson, a bit more sedate, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, these kind of words, you know, they all come in threes. Those closings, they work well, especially if it goes back to the beginning as well. Small lectern. Above all, dress in something that makes you feel great. Dress slightly more formally than the audience, he says. Avoid accessories that make noise. Probably one more for the women than the men, I suspect. Avoid black, white, and small patterns if the speech is being video recorded. Consider where your microphone will go. You know, I always want to know, is it going to be on a lectern? Because if I'm turning, that's going to cause loss. Is it on a lapel? And if I'm holding it, well, then I've got less room to use hand actions. And you need to practice accordingly for all of those scenarios. Okay, voice and movement. When you're telling an anecdote, speak more quickly because the information is easy to take in and process. When it's scientific data, speak slowly. You might even have to repeat it. When you're explaining a concept, slow down so the audience has time to digest and comprehend the information, especially data. Add a few pauses to highlight important points or to allow the audience well, time for laughter, hopefully, with you, not at you but also to let a point sink in, because they might have got distracted during that time frame. What about managing your nerves? Well, he explains that adrenaline gives you energy and animates your voice, which can be great for your speech. The following are ways that Anderson says you can manage your adrenaline and project confidence at the same time. If all else fails, Anderson says to simply tell the audience you're nervous. I like that one. I like that one. Okay, they want to root for you and admitting that you're experiencing nerves only makes you more relatable and people often forget to do this. Right, that's it. That's where we go. Thank you all very much. Like and follow for more. I'm going to give more uh, short form book summaries to people to help them in all sorts of subjects from public speaking to how to write well uh, to being a better entrepreneur. So like and follow for more. And have a look at the links in my bio as well. They're all also at my campaignforamillion.com. Campaignforamillion.com. And you get lots of free materials there as well. Thank you.